A very good evening aspirants before moving on to the analysis for today for the attention of viewers one small announcement Shankar IAS Academy is conducting free mains scholarship test 2020 for its YouTube channel subscribers This scholarship test consists of 5 mains questions on daily current affairs So from 27th to 31st July one mains question will be given from the daily Hindu news analysis every day and these questions will be published along with the hindu news analysis video from 27th of july to 31st july of 2020 so don't forget the dates it is 27th july to 31st july welcome to the hindu news analysis by shankar ias academy for the date 21st july 2020 these are the list of news articles chosen for today's analysis it has been provided along with the page numbers of different editions of hindu newspaper The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the time stamping for the displayed articles is provided in the description box and also in the comment section. Let's move on to the first news article discussion for today. The first discussion for today is based on this editorial which is with reference to the private participation for the operation of passenger train services. As you know recently government allowed private participation in over 109 pairs of routes through introduction of 151 modern trains. and based on this on 5th july 2020 hindu news analysis we discussed about the proposal of the government then the need to have private participation in railways then we also discussed the objectives of the liberalization in the railway sector and today we will discuss this editorial which is authored by former senior indian railways officers and in this editorial they have highlighted various issues that may arise because of the current proposed arrangements related to the private participation The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. Initially, authors have noted the criteria for this private participation, which mentions that the private players will invest in the procurement and maintenance of coaches, that is, the passenger coaches. And these private modern trains will, however, use all the other infrastructure owned by the Indian Railways. See here, when we say other infrastructure owned by the government, it refers to track facilities and associated structures, then stations, signalling, security, and daily maintenance of these structures, etc. So the responsibility of the private investor ends with the investment in the procurement and maintenance of coaches. But the train operation, safety, and dealing with the everyday problems has to be handled by the Indian Railways only. So this is where the role of private participation has to be worked out. Now keeping this in mind let us discuss the issues related to these developments the first issue is with respect to the fixing fares for travelling in these private modern trains according to the authors in these trains the participating private players will be fixing the fares by themselves so in such a scenario the fares could be on the levels of air conditioned bus fares or even to the levels of air flight fares so as a result of this such trains will be beyond the reach of common man and it will defeat the objective of railways as a public welfare transport organization so in this regard authors also provide suggestion which is that the fare determination in such trains has to be determined only in consultation with the government like how it is done in the case of some metro railway services See this suggestion of author is valid because if the fares in these private trains are to be comparable to the air travel then people will obviously choose air travel over private passenger trains because air travel will additionally save their travel time also so in this way this suggestion will help now the second issue is that according to the author the proposed arrangement will lead to day to day challenges now these day to day challenges are expected to happen and continue in the proposed setup even if an independent regulator is set up This is because of the dual roles in the process which gives room for day to day disputes or issues. So what do we mean by dual role here? See this simply means that the coaches are procured and maintained by the private and the coaches are to be operated by the government. So whenever some issues will happen then the operator will blame the maintenance team then the maintenance team will blame the operator. So what can be the solution to this problem? One solution provided by the author is that in such areas where there is private participation the role of private should be reduced only to invest in new coaches and their role should not be in day to day or regular maintenance of the coaches. Now if this is followed then the coaches will be operated and maintained by the Indian Railways as a single player and thus it will facilitate smooth operations. There is also one another solution provided by the author that is the government should not operate these trains 
and the government should play only the role of facilitator like giving permissions allocation of routes etc now in this manner both the operation and maintenance will be in the hands of private players so there will be smooth operations and the day to day issues related to presently proposed dual roles will be minimized or they will be nullified so by using either of these solutions this basic issue in the current proposed arrangement should be resolved now in addition to these suggestions author provides another suggestion which is with respect to the coaches run by indian railways see as we know and also according to the author the coaches in india are not of international standards so india should take advantage of the recent changes in coach designs so the government should go for state of the art coach designs using the transfer of technology with world leaders now if the coaches are made with international standards then it will minimize the operational maintenance cost and it is expected that this will be much lesser than how much we are currently spending for the operation and maintenance of existing coaches which are not even of international standards now the next issue and suggestion is with respect to the government's idea to increase the maximum running speed to 160 km per hour see this is a welcome measure because if the speed increases then the travel time will automatically decrease but according to the author accomplishing this running speed before the start of operations of private trains will be difficult this is because of the existing gaps in the railway infrastructure see according to the government the private passenger trains operations are to start by april 2023 so in this regard author suggests to fill the existing gaps in railway infrastructure such as indian railways has to take measures for track strengthening then it should eliminate curves and level crossing gates then they should strengthen bridges then track fencing should be built especially in the densely populated areas to facilitate the achievement of maximum running speed now if all these gaps are not addressed then we might have to see many rail related accidents such as derailment then persons getting hit by fast trains etc in the future then the next important issue is with reference to employment opportunities for the marginalized sections see at present due to the positive discrimination through reservation persons from backward sections are accommodated in the railway sector so this adds inclusiveness in the employment opportunities in the railway sector but if the private players are to be engaged in the railway sector then they should also follow the reservation regulations in employment in the railway sector because currently the private players will not be bound to follow these reservation regulations so according to the authors some kind of understanding must be arrived between the private players and the government so as to ensure the continuation of railways as an inclusive participatory and welfare based sector so that is all about this editorial discussion moving on to the next discussion this news article mentions that the parliamentary standing committee on subordinate legislation has decided to write to the ministry of home affairs regarding the status of rules for citizenship amendment act so in this discussion we'll see the news and we will also see about the parliamentary standing committee on subordinate legislation the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference as you know the citizenship amendment act of 2019 was passed by the parliament and it received assent of the president of india in december 2019 but even after 6 months of passing this act the ministry of home affairs has not yet framed the rules see this is important because according to the manual of parliamentary procedures which is regarding the subordinate legislation it says that the statutory rules regulations and bylaws will be framed within a period of 6 months from the date on which the relevant statute came into force but now the 6 months has passed so because of this the news article mentions that without the rules being notified the act cannot come into force or it cannot be implemented so for this only the parliamentary standing committee on subordinate legislation which has not received any communication from the ministry of home affairs has decided to write to the ministry on the status of these rules so before seeing about this particular committee just know that there are two kinds of parliamentary committees one is standing committee and the second one is ad hoc committees now these standing committees are permanent and regular committees which are constituted from time to time and this is done according to the provisions of an act of parliament or according to the rules of procedure and conduct of business in lok sabha and the work of the standing committees are of continuous nature and this is where the main difference between standing committees and ad hoc committees comes because ad hoc committees are appointed for a specific purpose and they cease to exist when they finish the task which is assigned to them and when they submit a report now one such example for parliamentary standing committees 
is the parliamentary standing committee on subordinate legislation so what do we mean by subordinate legislation it is the legislation made by an authority subordinate to the legislature now such legislation is to be made within the framework of the powers that is delegated by the legislature and this is the reason why this subordinate legislation is also known as delegated legislation so with respect to today's news article as you know parliament has enacted the law and now minister of home affairs which is a subordinate body to the parliament has to frame the rules so this is where this committee comes into play see as you know legislation is an inherent and inalienable right of parliament so it has to make sure that this power is not usurped or seized from it under the guise or cover of what is called as subordinate legislation so because of this the legislature has evolved an important mechanism to exercise control over the delegated legislation and this mechanism is the committee on subordinate legislation now this committee of the legislature examines if the powers conferred by the constitution or the delegated powers under the act passed by legislature have been duly exercised and they are within the conferment or delegation and they are not beyond these powers this means the committee has to make sure that the delegated legislation does not transgress or breach into the areas which are not prescribed for it and in this regard know that both lok sabha and rajya sabha have their own committee on subordinate legislation and the functioning of committee on uh, subordinate legislation in lok sabha is largely governed by the rules 317 to 322 of the rules of uh, procedure and conduct of business in lok sabha and likewise in rajya sabha this committee is constituted under the rules of procedure and conduct of business in rajya sabha and know that for the first time the committee in lok sabha was constituted in december 1953 and it has been constituted ever since every year and according to the rules the committee shall consist of not more than 15 members who shall be nominated by the speaker and know that a minister shall not be nominated as a member of the committee and if a member who is nominated to the committee is appointed as a minister later then such member shall cease to be a member of this committee from the date of such appointment and the term of office of members of this committee shall not exceed 1 year according to the rules now similarly the committee in rajya sabha shall consist of 15 members and they are nominated by the chairman of rajya sabha and they hold office until a new committee is nominated so that is all about this discussion in this discussion we saw about the parliamentary standing committee on subordinate legislation we also saw about the meaning of subordinate legislation now know that the topic of parliamentary committees is very important from prelims perspective and also from mains perspective as you can see already in 2019 and 2017 there are questions on parliamentary committees in mains paper like this question asks why do you think the committees are considered to be useful for parliamentary work discuss in the context the role of estimates committee now this question focuses on estimates committee and this question of 2017 it focuses on public accounts committee now likewise there are also questions in prelims like this 2013 question focuses on the parliamentary committee on public accounts this is a three statement question and the correct answer is option b 2 and 3 only the first statement is incorrect because this committee consists of 22 members 15 from lok sabha and 7 from rajya sabha and then very recently in 2018 there is a question on the committee on subordinate legislation itself here the question asks with reference to the parliament of india which of the following parliamentary committees scrutinizes and reports to the house whether the powers to make regulations rules sub rules bylaws etc conferred by the constitution or delegated by the parliament are being properly exercised by the executive within the scope of such delegation now just now we saw this is the function of the committee on subordinate legislation so the correct answer is option b so you can understand the importance of parliamentary committees so take a note of it whenever a parliamentary committee is mentioned in news with this we come to the end of this discussion the displayed practice question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next discussion this news article talks about the recently launched hope probe it was launched yesterday i know that this uh, hope probe is a mars orbiter mission which is built by united arab emirates and that is why this mission is also known as emirates mars mission and this mission has been launched from the tanegashima space center in japan now this mission is very important for united arab emirates because until now only india usa former soviet union that is uh, russia then the european space agency have successfully sent the missions to orbit mars now in this list uae has also joined now 
and know that this mission will orbit mars and it will study the dynamics of martian atmosphere and it will study the interaction between martian atmosphere with the outer space and with the solar wind and the primary scientific objectives of this mission are to search for the connection between current martian weather and the ancient climate of mars then it aims to study the loss of uh, mechanisms of mars's atmosphere to the space and this will be done by tracking the behavior and escape of hydrogen and oxygen from mars's atmosphere then it will also investigate how the lower and upper levels of martian atmosphere are connected and finally it will create a global picture of how the martian atmosphere varies throughout the day and throughout the year so that means the hope probe will be the first probe to provide a complete picture of the martian atmosphere and its layers when it reaches the red planet's orbit in 2021 and know that the mohammed bin rashid space center is responsible for the execution and supervision of all the stages of this hope probe now this mohammed bin rashid space center which is home to the uae national program on space was founded in 2006 it has launched dubai sat 1 dubai sat 2 and also khalifat sat in the past and remember after the launch of this hope probe uae has become the first arab country to launch a mission to the mars and as we already saw the probe is expected to enter the mars orbit in 2021 and this year is very special for uae because it is the golden jubilee year of founding of united arab emirates so this mission is going to be a memorable mission for united arab emirates so that is all about this discussion whenever a space mission is launched by a foreign agency in that you should know who launched it which space center launched it and which space center is uh, responsible for its execution and supervision then what is the objectives of that mission these points are very important from the prelims perspective with this we come to the end of this discussion the display practice question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next discussion this news article mentions about the recent stand of election commission of india and the amendments to the conduct of election rules of 1961 See if you remember on 2nd July Hindu news analysis we saw that election commission of india has proposed to relax the age of those eligible senior citizens for the postal ballots and it proposed to relax the age from 80 to 65 years so as to facilitate the senior citizens to vote in the upcoming bihar state elections during the covid-19 pandemic now to enforce this the ministry of law and justice has amended the conduct of election rules of 1961 and it has been amended by the conduct of elections amendment rules of 2020 so what are the amendments made firstly it has amended the meaning of absentee voter by adding an extra condition on that day we saw that absentee voter means a person belonging to such class of persons as may be notified by the government and who is employed in essential services as mentioned in the said notification and it also includes an elector belonging to the class of senior citizen or persons with disability now the amendment has included another condition that is the covid-19 suspect or affected persons will also be called as the absentee voter from now onwards So now to define the COVID-19 suspect or affected persons a new clause is inserted in rule 27A of the 1961 rules it has inserted the clause F and according to this clause COVID-19 suspect or affected persons means the electors who are tested as COVID-19 positive by the government hospital or the hospital recognized by the government as COVID hospital It also includes persons who are under home quarantine or institutional quarantine due to COVID-19 and who are certified by a competent authority notified by the state government or the union territory administration. So remember in the upcoming elections the persons who have been tested as COVID-19 positive or who are under home quarantine or institutional quarantine are eligible to vote as absentee voter. Then after this the next amendment is to enforce the proposal of election commission of India for that the rule 27a clause e is amended so from now onwards senior citizen for the purpose of uh, postal ballot means an elector belonging to the class of uh, absentee voters and is above 65 years of age so here the 80 years is substituted with 65 years now these amendments are important because an absentee voter can vote through postal ballot and it could be a normal one or an electronically transmitted postal ballot system so in the upcoming bihar elections these eligible voters can vote through postal ballot 
and this is as per rule 18 clause a which allows the absentee voter to vote through postal ballot and other than that the special voters service voters then voters on election duty then electors subjected to preventive detention are also entitled to vote by post in a parliamentary election or an assembly constituency election so now what the eca has asked has been done by the ministry of law and justice but now what eca has told is that after this amendment is done it has told that extending postal ballots to the senior citizens in the upcoming bihar assembly election is not possible it is because more than 70 lakh electors are above 65 years of age in bihar and this is about 10 percentage of the total electors in the state so election commission of india has cited logistical challenges then staff in safety protocol related constraints now these challenges arise because according to the news article the facility for this category of electors that is for the senior citizen electors is not the conventional postal service see as we saw on 2nd july in a conventional postal ballot system postal ballot paper is printed for each and every eligible voter of the constituency then it is put in an envelope inscribed with the address of the record office of each eligible voters and it is sent to them but this conventional postal ballot system is not followed for senior citizens it is said that for senior citizens the polling stations will be on the move in which the polling staff will visit the homes of the senior citizens for getting the votes on postal ballots so this means if there are 70 lakh electors in that age group in bihar then eci will need substantial staff and safety protocol and this will be difficult in this current pandemic so that is why eci has said it is not possible to enforce this postal ballot for the senior citizens in the upcoming bihar assembly elections so that is all about this discussion the displayed practice question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next discussion which is based on this news article it talks about the consumer protection e-commerce rules of 2020 these rules have been framed under the consumer protection act of 2019 which will come into force next week So today we'll have a comprehensive discussion on the provisions of these rules and the act of 2019. The syllabus that is relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. So let us first see on whom these rules are applicable. These rules are applicable to all the goods and services which are bought or sold over electronic network. It will be applicable to all the models of e-commerce which includes the marketplace model or the inventory model of e-commerce. And these rules are also applicable to e-commerce retailers. but note that these rules will not be applicable to any activity of a natural person which is carried out in a personal capacity and which is not a part of any professional or commercial activity but these rules are applicable to an entity which is not established in india but offers goods or services to consumers in india so what are the duties of e-commerce entities under these rules according to the rules every e-commerce entity shall provide all relevant details about it like the name of the entity its address on its e-commerce platform then the rules prohibit the e-commerce companies from indulging in unfair trade practices and more importantly according to the rules the e-commerce portals will have to set up a robust consumer redressal mechanism and all the e-commerce entities should appoint a grievance officer for consumer grievance redressal and the rules make sure that they must acknowledge the receipt of any consumer complaint within 48 hours and they have to redress the complaint within 1 month from the date of receipt of that complaint then additionally the rules bar the e-commerce entities from imposing cancellation charges on consumers after the consumers cancel a confirmed purchase so that means this provision will make many of the consumers happy but remember here that the cancellation charges will be allowed if the similar charges are borne by the e-commerce entity when the e-commerce entity itself cancels any purchase order unilaterally that is unilaterally for any reason the e-commerce entity cancels any purchase order and if there is a charge for that cancellation by that e-commerce entity then the e-commerce entity can impose cancellation charges on the consumers also then apart from this the rules prohibit the entity from manipulating the price of uh, the goods and services to gain the unreasonable profit now let us see the obligations of sellers according to these rules under the rules sellers cannot refuse to take back goods or uh, they cannot refuse to withdraw services 
they also cannot refuse refunds in certain conditions like these conditions include when such goods or services are defective they are deficient or if they are delivered late and if they do not meet the description on the platform then the entity has to take back the goods and has to refund the consumer then the rules also make sure that the seller should display all relevant details about the goods and services in the platform so that means in case of an import the goods should have the name of the origin country in addition to the origin country the details should include the total price then the constant price details such as the delivery charge expiry date wherever applicable then it should also mention the guarantees related to the authenticity of the product so these are some of the important provisions in the consumer protection e-commerce rules of 2020 now in this scenario let us see about the consumer protection act of 2019 also this act replaced the consumer protection act of 1986 and this act will empower consumers and it will help them in protecting their rights through various notified rules and provisions now this act protects consumer rights because it provides for provisions for establishment of consumer protection councils then central consumer protection authority then consumer disputes redressal commissions it has provisions for mediation etc and this new act also introduces the concept of product liability see product liability is the legal liability which a manufacturer or a trader incurs for the producing or selling of a faulty product so through this product liability concept The 2019 Act brings the product manufacturer, then the product service provider, and also the product seller within the scope for any claim for compensation. Now we saw that it provides provision for establishments of uh, consumer protection councils, and know that this Central Consumer Protection Council is an advisory body on consumer issues. It will be headed by the Union Minister of Consumer Affairs, Food and Public Distribution, and know that the council has a three-year tenure. then the central consumer protection authority will be established to promote protect and enforce the rights of consumers i know that this ccpa will have an investigation wing which will be headed by a director general and it will be empowered to conduct investigations into the violations of consumer rights and it will be empowered to institute complaints and prosecution and this authority can also order the recall of unsafe goods or services or it can order the discontinuance of unfair trade practices and misleading advertisements also not only that this authority will have powers to impose penalties on the manufacturers endorsers or publishers of the misleading advertisements apart from this the 2019 act provides for simplifying the consumer dispute adjudication process in the consumer commissions for this the state and district commissions are given powers to review their own orders and the act also provides provisions for consumer to file complaints electronically then as we saw already the act provides for mediation as an alternate dispute resolution mechanism so it makes the process of dispute adjudication much simpler and quicker so that is all about this discussion now finally we have come to the last session for the day which is the practice questions discussion session the question asks which of the following category of persons are entitled to vote by post at an election in a parliamentary or assembly constituency so that means indirectly this question is asking about who are all eligible to use postal ballots and during discussion we saw that rule 18 of the conduct of election rules of 1961 mentions about the persons who are entitled to vote by post and this includes special voters service voters voters on election duty then electors subjected to preventive detention and then absentee voters now here that means 1 2 3 4 are there and the persons with disability and senior citizens are included in the absentee voters now here know that special voters are those who are holding any office in india declared by the president in consultation with the election commission and know that the spouse of such person is also covered under the purview of special voter and as you know then service voters are the voters who are serving in the armed forces of the union then who are employed in a post outside india under government of india such as ambassadors of india etc and voter on election duty means any polling agent or any polling officer then presiding officer or the other public servant who is an elector in the constituency so that means in a hurry don't think correct answer is option d 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 because if you see option 6 it mentions senior citizens above 60 years of age 
Now see previously it was 8 years of age and today we discussed that it has been reduced to 65 years not 60 years. So the lower age limit to be eligible for postal ballot is 65 years not 60 years. So the correct answer is option C 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 only. Now this next question is a pair based question. On one side mission prober rover is given and on the other side destination is given. Now the first pair is hope probe Mars. Today only we discussed about this and this pair is a correctly matched pair. And here if you see the question asks for the incorrectly matched pair. That means one should not be in answer. So if you remove options A, C and D you can arrive at the correct answer which is option B 2 and 3 only. Now in this 2 is incorrect because Tianwen is the first Mars mission of China. It is not a mission to Sun and this mission comprises of a lander and orbiter. And uh, this mission is scheduled to launch on 23rd July 2020, that is in this week only. And this mission will make a 7 month trip to Mars and it will be arriving in early 2021. And the scientific objectives of this mission are to study the Martian topography and geology, then to characterize the soil and its uh, water ice content. Then it also aims to determine the composition of the surface material and it aims to profile the Martian ionosphere, climate etc. Now this third pair is incorrect because this Perseverance rover is a part of NASA's Mars Exploration Program. And this Mars Exploration Program of NASA has uh, the Mars 2020 mission also. So together the Mars 2020 mission along with Perseverance rover is part of NASA's Mars Exploration Program. And it is a long term effort of uh, robotic exploration of the red planet Mars and this mission is timed for launch at the end of this month but already this mission has been postponed many times so let us see whether it is launched in this month or not. Now this Mars 2020 mission addresses high priority science goals for Mars exploration including the potential for life on Mars and this mission will seek signs of habitable conditions on Mars in the ancient past and it will search for signs of past microbial life also. So in this Hope Probe Tianwen-1 and then Perseverance Rover, all these targets Mars and that is why 2 and 3 are incorrect. Now this next question is based on Committee on Subordinate Legislation. The first statement is it is an ad hoc committee which ceases to exist when it submits its report. See, we know that ad hoc committee ceases to exist when it submits its report. But whether this committee is an ad hoc committee? No, it is a standing committee. And standing committees are permanent and regular committees which are constituted from time to time. So first statement is incorrect. Now the second statement is a minister shall not be nominated a member of the committee. Now this is the correct statement. We discussed this uh, during news analysis. We saw that if a member of committee after being appointed as a member is appointed as a minister then such member shall cease to be a member of this committee from the date of such appointment. So this statement is correct and here the question asks for the correct statements. So the correct answer is option B 2 only. With this we have come to the end of today's Hindi news analysis. If you like the video don't forget to like, comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation.